Hello, welcome. It's great to be with you. Thanks for joining me for this session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hossel, and I'm coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, a uh, joint venture of PATH Presenter and the Digital Pathology Association, which offers free membership to uh, international uh, associates uh, in low resource settings and to all trainees uh, in pathology or other disciplines, of course, as well. So I'd like to uh, begin our case today and uh, talk about a uh, realm of gynecologic pathology uh, that uh, continues to evolve. Um, and uh, the patient uh, that we'll talk about is a uh, elderly patient uh, in her early 70s who has uh, been found to have a cervical mass. Now, of course, that's going to lead to a biopsy. And in almost all cases, uh, it's going to be some sort of a carcinoma um, and uh, usually squamous, but occasionally adenocarcinoma. But the reason I'm bringing this case up is not because it's a diagnostic challenge, but because there's an area of uh, development uh, that I think is important for you to know about. And that is that in 2020, the classification for cervical cancers was modified somewhat, uh, in particular, the uh, adeno and squamous carcinomas to differentiate between HPV associated and HPV independent uh, carcinomas. Of course, we preserve a category where we don't know um, or can't classify the particular type. Um, and we know that there are some types of adenocarcinoma which are more frequently in this HPV independent uh, category as well. Uh, but I think this underscores the need for us to be thinking uh, with each uh, carcinoma biopsy uh, or sample, uh, what are the appropriate age groups and so forth, and uh, what need we do to classify uh, these tumors. So uh, in this case, our patient's biopsy uh, was uh, a number of fragments of tissue, as you can see here, rather blue uh, sort of tissue uh, that uh, suggests that there's uh, some ulceration and some infiltration, no normal structures or no more surface identified. And as we come into higher magnification, we can see uh, cords and nests of uh, blue tumor cells uh, with uh, really a lot of inflammation around um, and uh, not much in the way of uh, evidence of keratinization. Um, now, because of her age group, um, she's certainly at higher risk for this to be a non-HPV associated tumor. Um, and so based on that alone, uh, we would certainly uh, recommend strongly doing uh, pertinent uh, immunohistochemical stains to differentiate uh, the two. Uh, we also wondered, of course, about uh, you know, solid forms of adenocarcinoma. Um, and so uh, we did three immunohistochemical stains. The first uh, here we'll uh, look at, uh, and as you can see, it shows some positive staining in our sample. Um, and we'll take a look at higher magnification here. And I believe you'll recognize that this is a nuclear stain. Uh, so uh, this could be uh, two, one of two things. It could be a, a squamous marker like P40 or P63. But in this case, uh, this is P53, uh, a surrogate marker for TP53 mutation in tissue samples that shows that this sample is quite uniformly uh, P53 mutated um, and hence uh, unlikely to be uh, positive uh, for HPV. Now here is our uh, uh, P63 stain, which also shows striking similar positivity, uh, indicating uh, entirely squamous differentiation uh, in this tumor. And then as you may have guessed, finally our uh, P16 stain, which here you can see nicely in the control tissues, both squamous and adeno, uh, shows essentially no uh, significant positive staining uh, in any of our tumor cells. Now we do have some sort of non-specific splotchy uh, staining in the inflammatory component uh, of this uh, tumor. So uh, based on these uh, findings, we would uh, render a diagnosis of HPV independent uh, squamous carcinoma. Um, and this is an important distinction. Although these are a small proportion of cervical carcinoma cases, 
they do have a pretty different or distinct uh, molecular profile from those of the uh, HPV associated tumors. Uh, so we see activation or alterations in KRAS, P10, TP53, which we've mentioned, uh, CTN and NNB1, ARID1A, ARID5B, and so forth, uh, quite characteristically in these tumors. Um, but perhaps even more important is that these patients don't do well. They have a lower progression-free survival. They have poor response to checkpoint inhibitors and some other chemotherapeutic agents, whether it's adeno or squamous uh, in this situation. So making this distinction has uh, clear-cut clinical uh, implications. Now, uh, you may have noticed uh, that uh, the inflammatory infiltrate was fairly strong in our tumor, and so you might think that the checkpoint inhibitors uh, might be a, a good uh, bet in these cases, uh, but in fact, the uh, inflammatory genes generally are quite a bit lower, uh, less, less likely to be expressed in these tumors, at least according to recent studies. Now, uh, some people have raised the question that, you know, how do these tumors arise? Could these just be um, HPV-provoked tumors where the HPV has disturbed? And to sort of uh, support that uh, diagnosis, uh, they proposed in a recent uh, article here from International Journal of Gynecologic Cancer, the, quote, hit and run theory, that at an early stage in life, there is a viral infection uh, that is the hit. Um, and that leads to a period of instability or epigenetic dysregulation, uh, and then a transitional transitional state in which both viral uh, epitopes and mutational epitopes are detected. But eventually, the uh, loss of the uh, virus uh, genes is uh, overrun by the uh, advantageous uh, mutations in the uh, uh, the cell, uh, leaving you with a. Uh, uh, a genetic uh, profile that uh, no longer shows any evidence of the E6 or E7 uh, mutations most frequently as seen, or activation most frequently as seen as associated with HPV. Now, whether this turns out to be true uh, it remains to be seen, but it's certainly an interesting theory uh, that may still unite and emphasize the value of HPV um, uh, immunization at the appropriate age group. Uh, but at this stage, uh, that will take a little bit more investigation. And perhaps some of you will be the ones doing that investigation. Well, our final sign-out diagnosis then, based on the findings that we've reviewed, squamous cell carcinoma, large cell non-keratinizing, but HPV independent. And that's certainly the uh, more important uh, factor here. Well, we hope that you enjoyed this session. Uh, and that if so, you'll uh, subscribe to our channel or uh, like the uh, video. Uh, we welcome uh, feedback and comments uh, here at our uh, either direct email or on uh, Twitter. Um, and of course, uh, we hope uh, that uh, if you liked it, that you'll share it with some of your colleagues and friends so that they can uh, be up to date on these uh, matters of uh, classification in the cervix as well. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me. <laughs>